Welcome back to Half the Battle. I'm your host as always, Daniel Levy, your co-host Shaq. We're going to be talking UFC Adelaide, Junior Dos Santos versus Taito Ivasa. And Shaq, it's going down this Saturday. The UFC returns to Australia, and it's a pretty stacked card, man. Yeah, it is, man. Mark Hunt's for the co-main event, Junior Dos Santos versus Tu Ivasa, who, you know, is kind of Mark Hunt's protege right there. And JDS looked good in his return uh, against uh, Ivanov, his last fight. And we know he's one of the legends in the sport. And, I mean, if he can take up this young guy and Tui Vasa, you know, he's right there in title contention. You know, heavyweight's kind of looking kind of shallow at the top these days. You know, uh, he could probably get that rebooking with Francis that they were supposed to do from back in the day. So, you know, uh, it's a lot of riding on, on this fight. Yeah, no doubt about it, man. A lot of Australian prospects taking on a tough opponent. And you bring up Francis and Ganu, and, man... A lot of people were counting him out as the the plus 200 next to his name indicated. And uh, how good was it to see him go out there and not just knock out a guy like Curtis Blades in 45 seconds, but to return to, to the form that many people thought uh, would take him to a UFC heavyweight championship? Yeah, I mean, he actually let his hands go for once. So, you know, the other two fights, he, uh, you know, I don't know what was going on, but I'm, I'm happy that he, uh, for now at least, has figured out uh, his issues. I mean, he put Blades down in less than 30 seconds, which is super impressive. So, props to him. Yeah, you know, instead of going out to France uh, two weeks before the fight, this time he did his entire camp there, right, Shaq? So he didn't self-sabotage himself this time. And uh, he went out there and did his thing. So I'm excited to see what's next for him. But Shaq, let's do this whole card start to finish, my man, because first up, we got Kai Car of France. He's minus 400, and the comeback on Elias Garcia is plus 325. Now, Shaq, uh, Kai Carr of France is a guy that's definitely paid his dues on the regional scene. He's had his ups and his downs. Very tough outing on the ultimate fighter against Alexandre Pantoja. And Elias Garcia, he also uh, didn't have the easiest run when he made his UFC debut against Mark De La Rosa. Now they meet in Australia. Who you got? Yeah, you know, I think Garcia is probably going to show up a little better this time. Um, I still think he's real young. I think he's only got like what six fights. I still think uh, he's got a long, a long, long way to go. You know, his wrestling's still in question. His boxing's in question. You know, uh, he uh, he had an impressive KO when they went to the looking for a fight show down there in Mexico. But you know, Kai Car France. You know, he's a big power striker. He trains with uh, Hooker and Israel and those guys. And, you know, I just think that Garcia has too many holes in his striking game. You know, I think Kai Car France, you know, I don't want to say he's a front runner, but I think he's going to be able to do his job here. You know, I think he's going to be able to land the cleaner combos. And, you know, I just feel like Garcia is going to be a step behind. I do think he's going to be, you know, a little better than his debut. But I just think uh, he's still got a lot, a long ways to go. Uh in terms of his development. Yeah, you know, Elias Garcia has as many fights as Kai Car France has losses. I mean, that's the difference in experience here. Huge experience gap. Definitely goes to Kai Car France. But, I mean, look, Elias Garcia, like you said, he's probably going to look better in this fight than he did in his debut. Look, he's a talented guy. Will go for explosive moves. But I think Kai Car France wins the long-term battle here. Probably going to try to chop him down with leg kicks. I mean, he's out there, like you said, training with Dan Hooker, Israel Adesanya. Alex Volkanovsky, there's something in the water over there at that camp. Uh, those guys are going out there and putting on shows, and I think that Kai Car France is going to do the same thing in his UFC debut, and hopefully they keep Elias Garcia around because I do think he is a talented kid. He just uh, ran into two extremely tough matchups in uh, in his debut and a sophomore appearance, but uh, I think he'll be back. But I got Kai Car France. Now next up in the featherweight division, we got Demir Ismagulov. He's minus 490, and the comeback on Alex Gorgies is plus 390. Now Shaq, uh, both newcomers, I was going to say both are undefeated, but that's actually not the case because Demir Ismagulov, he's taken uh, his first L and a second L. Ironically enough, they're both to a guy named Ramazan. So you already know the deal there with that Russian local scene. You know how tough it is going out there on the M1 global scene. And uh, he actually made it to the championship over there. Very strong guy. He can take you down. He can mount you. He can pound you out. But he can also stand and bang. I mean, they were going to give him Joe Duffy in his UFC debut. And as soon as uh, Duffy uh, 
saw that name, uh, you know, he, he went running. He wanted no part of it. And Alex Gorgies, he's a super exciting guy. You know, he, he hasn't fought the same level of competition as Demir Ismagulov. But one thing I'll say about Alex Gorgies, uh, he might be uh, the next Australian Diaz brother. You know, he's a very long striker. He likes to talk shit in there. He's going to have a lot of fight of the night performances. If, if this one stays standing, I mean, I still favor Demir, but I think that Alex Gorgies can make things super interesting. He's out there, you know, training at Australian top team with guys like Ashkan, guys like Suman. So he's getting some decent work in Australia. However, I think that the difference here is that Demir can get this one to the mat. And in doing so, uh, I think he's going to win rounds that way, potentially pound him out along the way. I'm going to go with Demir Ismagulov uh, for the victory here, Shaq. Yeah, I got a Demir is Gulov as well. I just feel like he's fought the better competition. He's going to be more ready for this moment. I see a 30 27 dominant decision. Now, next up in the welterweight division, we got Keita Nakamura. He's minus 185, and the comeback on Salim Tuari is plus 160. And now, Shaka, Salim Tuari, in his debut, they gave him Warley Alves. Now they're giving him Keita Nakamura. Not uh, the easiest road for the prospect. Uh, you think he gets it done as the underdog here? Yeah, they're giving Salim two fairly uh, tough two fights to start off his UFC career. You know, he didn't look too bad against Warley. It was just a case of experience. You know, a case of being a little bit too green. I mean, he was solid. He performed fairly well in Qatar. You know, he had a reputation of giving everyone a tough fight. And, uh, you know, his last fight, it seemed like he ran into to, he ran into Anthony Martin now. So, it's, uh, you know, he definitely looked the worst he ever looked, though. By, and by far, you know, this guy had three tough rounds with Zaleski. He went three rounds with Tom Breeze. And, you know, had a fairly competitive uh Pay, uh, Ray, man. I mean, now he's uh, seems like he's on the decline now, man, a little bit. So this fight's going to be a little bit interesting to see if Kataro's on that much of a decline, because at, at the same point, this guy still got wins over Murano, Kyle No, and uh, he's very experienced and he's definitely faced way better competition. Um, Salim, he's got to adjust on the fly. He's got to be ready for these guys right now. Um, I feel like this fight could play out a little closer than the lines indicate. Like, you know, uh, Keitaro, like I said, he is on the decline in my opinion. We don't know. Uh, you don't know what you're going to see from him. But, you know, I think uh, that left kick is going to give Salim uh, a little bit of problems. And, you know, I feel like Keitaro's definitely got to be a little careful because I do give Salim the uh, slight boxing advantage. But I feel like this fight's going to be super close, man. I feel like, uh, as Kataro's fights usually are, you know, I feel like uh, it's going to be, you know, that left kick versus uh, Salim's boxing. You know, I feel like it's going to be a, one of those close, close decisions where both men, you know, kind of wobble. I definitely give uh, Kataro the edge on the mat, but, you know, I'm not sure how he's going to perform these days. So, you know, I, I'll take Kataro by close decision, but uh, it's going to be a good fight. Yeah, you know, Keita Nakamura is a submission specialist. He has 17 wins on his resume via submission, to be exact. And uh, if he takes your back, chances are uh, he's going to choke you unconscious. I mean, just ask my boy Li Jing Liang about that. And with Salim Tuari, like we already mentioned, very tough uh, UFC debut against Worley Alves, but he went out there, lasted the distance with him, took his ass whooping like a man. Now he's fighting Keita Nakamura. And I'm a big fan of Keitaro, but man, it doesn't seem like the same guy the last few fights. I, I feel like ever since that war he had with Zaleski, he's definitely slowed down a bit, man. Uh, he's still opportunistic, though. I mean, if uh, Salim comes out here, gives up his back, don't be surprised when Keita jumps up there, gets those hooks in, and sinks in the choke. But that being said, man, I feel like Salim's got the youth on his side. Also, he's been training with uh, Tony Martin, who absolutely dismantled Keitaro. So, you know, Tony's giving him all the insights as to how to beat this guy. And, uh, you know, Tony put on a fundamentals clinic against Keita Nakamura. I've never seen anyone whoop Ke Keita's ass like that ever. I mean, every time he's lost, it's always been super close. I mean, the Tom Breeze fight, people thought could have gone either way. Even even the fight with uh, Li Jing Liang, it was a comeback win. But that fight with Zaleski, after that fight, he hasn't been the same. The Alex Morano fight was uninspiring. The uh, Tony Martin fight was really, really bad for a guy like Keita Nakamura. So I'm, I'm definitely questioning uh, the level that he's on right now. And Salim Tuari, I've seen him finish guys with one shot on the regional scene. He's got a nasty left hand. He can get up from bottom, and uh, he's pretty experienced. So 
I'm going to actually go with uh, Salim Tuari for the upset here, Shaq. Now, next up in the UFC lightweight division, we got Christos Giagos. He's minus 365, and the comeback on Mizuto Hirota is plus 305. Shaq, both these guys desperately need a win for their UFC careers. Who do you think is going to get it? Yeah, you know, I was a little surprised to see Christos not in that high, considering that, you know, both of them, uh, both of them, you know, pretty much have the same UFC record. Both of them, you know, struggle to complete their job a lot, but, you know, uh, I feel like you got the old, you know, the old aging vet that, you know, struggles to win fights against the, you know, the younger, still a little old, even though he's uh, probably not even 30 yet. But, I mean, he's still got some wear and tear on him. And he definitely had to earn his way back to the UFC fighting in Russia, too. So, you know, I feel like Christos is just, you know, younger, fresher, can take a better shot. Uh it's kind of hard to trust him at that line, but I do think he'll, he'll win this fight. I think uh, there's a very good chance at a knockout. I mean, Pugnus' his last few fights, you know, uh, he's been having these botched weight cuts, uh, looking real sick on the scales. And, you know, at the, at his age, I mean, those things kind of take a toll on you in the long time game, man. So, you know, I think uh, Christos is actually going to come out here and, you know, not necessarily make a statement, but, you know, prove a point, you know. And uh, keep his job, you know. They saw at least, I'm I'm happy that he uh, earned his way back to the UFC, and I, I think he get rewarded. You know, I think he's gonna, I think he's got a dead man walking in front of him. So I, I like uh, Christos to get a finisher. Yeah, I mean, to me, this fight is you got the young, athletic journeyman versus the old, almost retired journeyman. So that being said, I completely understand why Christos is a big favorite here. You know, at the same time, both their UFC records are one and four. Christos does uh, drop the ball a lot, but man, he's signif- he's significantly younger in this spot. He's fresher, he's faster, he's hungrier. Mizuto Arota is a very tough guy. I'll tip my cap to him. Uh, he came through on that dog money against Cole Miller. I know you remember that, Shaq. And uh, he always comes to fight every single time if he can potentially get some takedowns, stay in the face of Christos Giagos, make it a dirty tough fight. Then maybe he can come out here and get this upset, but. More than likely, I feel like the firepower, the uh, the spirit, the energy, I feel like that's going to belong to Christos Giagos. I feel like he's going to land some big shots. I think he's going to throw some flying knees, maybe land some takedowns of his own. And I feel like this is going to be the spot where he actually comes out there and shows uh, his full game. So as long as he doesn't get caught with a submission along the way, not that Mizuto's some submission artist because he's absolutely not. I'm just saying that's been uh, how Christos has lost most of his fights. As long as that doesn't happen, I, I think he cruises here. Now, next up in the flyweight division, we got Ben Ten Nguyen. He's minus 150, and the comeback on Wilson Hayes is plus 130. Now, Shaq, a lot of people were surprised to see Wilson Hayes as the underdog, considering uh, what happened in Ben Ten's last fight against uh, Formiga, who's also a black belt just like Wilson Hayes. What's your opinion on the line, man? Yeah, um, well, Formiga just operates at a different frequency, and Wilson's on a three-fight losing streak. Um you know, Wilson, he's definitely, I can't put him in that same category as a Farmiga, even though he is a black belt, because, you know, although he is a black belt, he's manhandled guys like Ortiz. He's also had a couple of blunders here and there, you know, with the uh, Sasaki fight. You know, I don't think his jujitsu is as dominating as Farmiga's can be at times. Um, I definitely think Ben Ten's the better striker, but Ben Ten. You know, I question his IQ sometimes. I feel like he gets a little bit too carried away. I feel like he can get a little bit too wild. I feel like uh, he can be looking for the finish a little bit too much. And, you know, with a guy like Wilson who gets about four to five takedowns a fight, I mean, you got to be real careful because Wilson will just scramble and scramble and scramble. And that's what he can do. And, you know, uh, that's where he's got Ben 10 B. So it's going to be a really interesting fight because Wilson's one of those type of guys where uh, – He's, you know, he's real small, man. You can kind of, you know, the, the certain guys can, you know, walk him down and, you know, kind of bully him in a sense, you know, especially in the striking department, you know, his boxing still hasn't developed the way that you thought it would over these years. And, you know, uh, it's going to be a real tough fight. Ben 10, like I was saying before, he gets a little bit carried away like we've seen in the Smoker fight. Like uh, his last fight, you know, there's really no shame in that, you know, Formiga's just on a, completely different level and Formiga's got that good game plan and execution but uh in this fight it's gonna be tough man you know I'm actually kind of 
le- leaning towards Ben 10. You know, I think like Wilson's a little bit, you know, uh, also aging these days. And I just feel like, uh, you know, I don't think there's too big of a size difference, but I think there is a little bit of a strength difference. You know, I know Wilson's, you know, man, how those guys like this and Ortiz, but, you know, Ortiz and those guys, you know, they were looking to grapple against him. Uh, I think uh, that Ben 10 going to, you know, wobble him a couple of times, possibly even finish him. But I think uh, he's going to have that hometown, you know, uh, judging on his side. I think he's going to wobble Wilson more times. And, you know, I feel like he's going to stuff enough of the takedowns. I definitely see them hitting the mat here and there. But I feel like when they get back up to the feet, Ben 10, you know, he'll make up the difference in points and get his uh, hand raised. Yeah, I feel like you bring up great points, man. I'm actually surprised you picked Ben 10. I thought I was going to be the only one because I went back and I watched that Formiga fight. And honestly, man, up until uh, the third round, Ben 10, uh, not that he was winning the fight, but he wasn't doing that bad. He wasn't that far behind. I mean, he got taken down. He'd get back up, showed a nice butterfly guard. I mean, got back up to his feet, was landing some big shots. But I feel like a guy like Formiga, not only is his jiu-jitsu better than Wilson Hayes, as you saw when they fought, But his striking is also a lot better than Wilson Hayes. I mean, Formiga is comfortable standing in that pocket, landing big shots, whereas Wilson Hayes, he has to tie up. He has to get that fight to the mat right away. And I think that Wilson Hayes' chin is definitely in question here. You know, not saying he's going to get knocked out with the first punch. You know, he's not like my boy uh, Chuck Liddell or anything like that. But I I have noticed that he gets wobbled in a good uh, a good majority of his fight, Shaq. You hit this guy hard enough, uh, he will do the chicken dance in there. And Ben Wen throws some concussive blows, no doubt about it. It's just with Ben Wen, sometimes he has these mental lapses in his fights. And, you know, you remember back on the regional scene when he got finished in like four fights in a row, you know. Even the Smolka fight, he's dominating the grappling exchanges. Instead of just standing back up, he decides, oh, I can beat him here on the mat. And then uh, he ended up losing on the mat. And uh, the Formiga fight, I just feel like that wasn't even a mental lapse. I feel like that was just credit to Formiga being, you know, the perennial top five guy that he is. Uh, It it was what it was, but I feel like he's got a more winnable matchup here with Wilson Hayes. He's just got to come out here and make some slight adjustments. Take those learning lessons from your last fight, apply them here, and I think he goes out here and he gets this win, man, against an aging Wilson Hayes. So I'm going to go with Ben Wen as well. Now, next up in the welterweight division, we got Alexei Kunchenko. He's minus 340. The comeback on Yushin Okami is plus 280. Shaq, we've seen Yushin Okami at 185, at 205. Now we see him at 170 once again. You think he's going to get it done here as an underdog against the undefeated Alexei Kunchenko? Yeah, I mean, uh, Yushin had some good execution his last fight against uh, Diego. I mean, he executed his game plan perfectly. He just smothered him, got on top of him, and did his thing. And, you know, uh, Kunchenko, on the other hand, also had a a fairly tough fight with Thiago in his debut in Russia. And, you know, the nerves could have been there. So there's definitely a chance he, you know, comes a little more comfortable, a little better. Um, You know, I think Kunchenko is, uh, you know, a little bit slower paced, uh, you know, big muscular, a little stiffer, um, very patient, calm. But, you know, he's got that Russian coasting style. You know, it's kind of inactive at times. Uh, you know, they like to spend a lot of time in the tie-ups. Uh, you know, the inactivity can just be... But, you know, they generally turn it up uh, at the end of the round. It's kind of like, you know, a, a Rustam style or, you know, just that uh, typical Russian style. You know, I feel like uh, Yushin can't take Alexi down, at least not consistently, probably not at all. And... Kunchenko, one thing I like about him is, you know, he's very steady. You know, he's he's the same guy throughout the entire fight. You know, he's gonna he's gonna keep moving forward at a slow, slow pace, and eventually, you know, when he closes that distance off, uh, that's when he lets his hands go toward. It's generally towards the end of the round. It just takes him, you know, four minutes to start doing that. But you know, I feel like you should. Uh, at least in the straightaway at distance, you know, I feel like uh, he's got a nice one, too. I feel like he's got a, a nice left kick, but, you know, his chin, you know, his chin has never been the, the strong point in his game, and, you know, although I think uh, Kunfenko doesn't throw as frequent frequently as I would like, you know, I feel like uh, he does have power, and I feel like, you know, eventually he could possibly, you know, drop Yushin and uh 
and you know hurt him throughout the fight but you know like he just has that coasting style you know i feel like this there's a very good chance this fight goes three rounds you know i definitely feel like it could have his you know lackluster moments i i definitely lean kunchenko i feel like he's you know even though i do feel like he's on the you know older slower side of the russian totem pole you know i do feel like uh He's just a better athlete. I feel like he's just a stronger guy he, and a fresher in terms of taking damage. So, you know, I like Kunchenko to win a, you know, a, a tough decision. You know, oftentimes when you hear a, about a guy making his UFC debut at 18 and 0, you question the level of competition. You, you question which regional scene they came from. But with a guy like Alexei Kunchenko, he came from the Russian regional scene. He's fought nothing but tough outs his entire his entire run, man. So it's as legit as they get, man. He's not some can crusher, but also, like you mentioned, you know, he is a, a Russian coaster. You know, this fight there are going to be a lot of there's going to be a lot of back and forth clinching. You know that Yushin Okami loves a good clinch fest. So as long as Alexei Kunchenko doesn't gas out here or doesn't just be too inactive, he should get the better of the shots on the feet in terms of he's got way more power than Yushin Okami. You know, Yushin might land three shots but then that one left hook landed by Kunchenko is going to wobble Yushin so he might uh Alexei might have to eat three to land one you know he's definitely the much shorter guy here he's listed at five foot eight I think he might be around five ten but look he's going to be significantly shorter than Yushin Okami but I think when he lands on the chin of Okami he can do some serious damage now whether he knocks him out or not that remains to be seen I have seen Kunchenko go out there and knock guys out but I've also seen him go out there and grind out those decisions so he's capable of doing both he's got a way fresher chin than Yushin Okami way less uh miles in the tank so I see this being his fight, man. I think he goes out there and he dominates uh, Yushin Okami and gets his second UFC win. You know, the thing with Kunchenko is when it's time to turn up, he'll finally turn up. You might have to you might have to warm up the engine for about four minutes, Shaq. You might have to put some gas in the car, but once it's finally time to let things go, once it's one-to-one -one going into the third round, he's going to get the job done for you. So I, I got Alexei Kunchenko here. Now next up in the featherweight division, we got Super Sodik Yusuf. He's minus 620. And the comeback on Suman Mokhtarian is plus 460. Now, Shaq, uh, both these guys making their UFC debuts. You going with the road favorite, Sodik Yusuf, or you think Suman Mokhtarian can pull off another twister here? Yeah, you know, I think Sadiq's just going to be too much for him. You know, I feel like Sadiq's ready to fight with the, with the, you know, some of the better guys in the division. You know, right now, you know, I feel like he's, that good uh suman i think he's also pretty good you know he had a good fight with ricky still I, I think he's got heart i feel like he's a tough guy but you know i just feel like his style is just uh not gonna do well with sadiq's you know so i feel like sadiq's just a brick house especially in the feet i think he's got a landslide advantage when it comes to you know inflicting damage and you know kickboxing boxing you know wrestling you know i feel like uh suman's just a tough tough guy but I just feel like he's going to be outgunned and outmatch everywhere in every aspect. And uh, I think Sadiq Yusuf gets a, a you know, a, a finished victory. But I feel like it's going to be one of those finished victories where it was brutal in the lead up, you know. Yeah, I can totally see this being a prolonged beating just because Suman Mokhtarian is definitely a very tough guy. You know, he's 8-0 for a reason. And on the regional scene, you got to give him a lot of credit. He's gone out there and gotten some very unorthodox submissions, a baseball bat choke. He got a teepee choke, which I haven't seen anyone else get in MMA. And also, uh, he had a twister. But interestingly enough, when you go back and you look at the kind of opponents he was doing those things to, let's just put it this way, Shaq. The guy that he landed that twister on, that guy's very next fight, he got submitted with a bicep slicer. Okay, Shaq? So... Uh, apparently that opponent was prone to getting a uh, fluke sub, you know, with, with something flashy. So it, it is what it is. We're going to talk about more fluke subs when we get to Paul Craig here in a second. But that's Suman Mokhtarian's only chance, and I don't even think he's going to do that because uh, Sodiq Yusuf, I think, I think if they grapple, Sodiq Yusuf is better on the mat as well. But, man, standing, it's going to be one of those mismatches where he, Sodiq's going to kick this guy on the calf, and you're going to see Suman Mokhtarian limp. But since he's so tough, he's not going to quit. He's going to take a lot of shots. It's going to be a brutal beatdown. I, I got Sodiq Yusuf here in a devastating fashion. I think the line, you know, it's minus 620. I think it could actually be a little bit higher than this, Shaq. So I'm going to go with the heavy favorite here. Now, next up in the light heavyweight division, 
We got Jim the Brute Crute. He's minus 250. And the comeback on Paul the Bear Jew Craig is plus 210. Now, Shaq, I know you remember the last time Paul Craig went out there. And uh, the only way he could win that fight against Ankalaev was a fluke sub. Well, it turns out he got the fluke sub with 10 seconds left in the fight. And uh, even though it was one of the most shocking upsets in UFC history, I mean, I got to say, with those last 10 seconds, uh, you know, he was uh, he had double wrist control. He was uh, baiting Ankalaev for that triangle. He set him up, but... Uh, you think you think lightning is gonna strike twice, my man? Yeah, you know, I, I definitely don't think it was a fluke. I mean, you know, Paul Craig, he's a he's a tough guy. I mean, he took his he took some sub, severe shots in that fight. He took Ankalaev down straight up in the middle of a cage. So I mean, Paul Craig deserves some level of respect. Uh, Jim Crew, he's a very young guy, but I mean, for such a young guy, I mean, he's got a lot of experience. He's been five rounds before. And, I mean, this guy, he's got a good motor. He's got good cardio. You know, he can push and push. You know, uh, his contender series fight, although it wasn't the best performance, I mean, he still knocked the guy out in the first round. And, I mean, uh, the guy likes to inflict damage. And, we you know, Paul Craig, uh, even though he's a tough guy, technically technically speaking, you know, he's really bad in areas, bad in areas to the point where, you know, he's been finished in the first round a couple times, just like the Khalil fight, like the Tyson Pedro fight. You know, he likes to throw those slowly low kicks and then he gets floored and dropped with punches. And, you know, uh, and I don't think, I think he's one of the type of guys that he's just going to stick with that, man. I think he's one of those guys that has to be able to win fights off these crazy, crazy moments. So, you know, I don't think it's going to work out here. I think it, things are going to resort back to old for Paul Craig. I think he's a tough guy, but I just feel like Jim Cruz, the more athletic guy, the stronger guy. Even if Jim Crew didn't get the first round finish, I think uh, he'd overpower Paul Craig throughout the three rounds. And uh, although Paul Craig's got some good jujitsu, I mean, Jim Crew's also got some good jujitsu. You know, I feel like uh, he's just a better fighter in every aspect of the game. So I like Jim Crew. Yeah, you know, much respect to Paul Craig. He's the kind of guy that'll take the ass whooping for uh, 14 minutes and 59 seconds and then pull off uh, the sub with one second left. So. That's definitely admirable, and that was amazing what he was able to pull off against Ankalaev. But, man, there's only so many times that you can do that in uh, in your MMA career. And uh, the definition of a fluke is an unlikely occurrence, uh, something based on luck. And that was basically what happened there against Ankalaev. I don't think it's going to happen again, man. And it's funny because when I hear some people breaking down this fight, you know, they're talking about, oh, if it stays standing, the advantage goes to Krupp. But if it hits the mat, the advantage goes to Paul Craig. And look, I respect Paul Craig's crown game a lot, but I feel like people don't know that uh, Jim Crew is actually a John Jocks Machado two-stripe brown belt. So he's actually a higher ranked, uh, he's, he's higher in the jiu-jitsu rankings than Paul Craig is. So if it does hit the mat, I think that Jim Crew will be perfectly suitable there to get back up to his feet. And, you know, the thing that, I've noticed with uh, some of these opponents with Paul Craig, uh, first of all, he won both of his UFC wins off of his back with triangle chokes against uh, Henrique Da Silva. They had a back and forth fight, but then in that second round, Henrique Da Silva was on top of him and he had a choice there. He could get back up, separate, make the guy stand back up, or uh, you could play some jujitsu with uh, Paul Craig, give him a chance to win the fight. And of course, the guy that's 2-6 and six in the UFC, uh, Henrik Da Silva, he decided to go into Paul Craig's guard, give him a chance to win, and uh, that's exactly what he did. With Jim Crute, I've seen situations where he's been on top of someone, and then uh, he gets back up and signals them, all right, son, time to, time to stand and bang with me. And I think that's exactly what he's going to do here if this fight does hit the mat. For a light heavyweight, he might be a little bit on the shorter side, even though he, he is fucking six foot two. so make no mistake about it, he's no hobbit or anything like that, but... He's definitely going to be the smaller guy, but with that said, he's he's the faster guy. He's the quicker guy. He's the more agile and fluid guy here, and uh, I like the fact that he darts in with big punches. Uh, he definitely emulates his style after Robert Whitaker, but he is a 205er, so he's going to be a little bit slower, a little bit clumsier, but he tries to emulate that exact footwork, as you saw in his contender series fight. He finishes his combos with, with low kicks, and obviously the John Jocks Machado two-stripe brown belt I was talking about, this fight hits the mat. Uh, don't be surprised when Jim Crute scrambles out of the bad positions and gets back uh, on top, or gets back up to his feet and makes Paul Craig stand with him. I think he's going to overwhelm Paul Craig. Uh, I think he comes out here and stops him. I'm going to go with Jim Crute for the victory. Now, next up in the welterweight division, this is going to be really good, Shaq. We got Jake Matthews. He's minus 125. And Anthony Rocco Martin. Tony Martin is plus 105. Now, Shaq, both these guys are the best versions of themselves that we've ever seen. So I got to know, man, who takes the next step up in the UFC welterweight rankings? 
Yeah, it's a great fight. Both of these guys are real confident right now. And since ever ever since they moved up, it seems like they've been seeing, uh, you know, gradually better versions of each guy. And, you know, uh, Jake, Jake Matthews, he's a big athletic powerhouse. And, you know, I'll kind of describe Tony as a well-rounded uh, technician, man, uh, and another good athlete, you know, and probably not the athlete of Jake, but still a very good athlete, and he's super confident right now. So, you know, uh, this fight's going to be really interesting. I'm looking for this fight, uh, looking forward to this fight very much. Um, you know, Jake, man, at 170, with his confidence right now, and that right hand he's got, I mean, you saw what he did to Lee Jing Leong, but we know Lee Jing Leong does get dropped every fight pretty much, but, I mean, that was still a great fight, because in the past, Jake uh, would have folded up in a situation like that, and Mentally, he got through it. And, I mean, Tony Martin, you know, he could say the same thing in his last fight. You know, his last fight and those type of fights, generally he would have, you know, stopped throwing or, you know, created some uh, some issues. So, you know, I feel like both guys are heading, uh, trending in the, right di- in, the, in the right direction. You know, I feel like uh, as far as this fight goes, I feel like Jake's, you know, faster, uh, stronger, uh, you know. But the... Uh, how I could see this fight possibly playing out is, you know, Jake getting off to a good start. But, you know, uh, I feel like Jake, you know, uh, at times, you know, if I had to say there was a knock on him, you know, he definitely thinks a little bit too much. And I'm not saying he's thinking too much for this fight. But I feel like, you know, Tony can uh, is skilled enough to play a game to make Jake think a little, a little bit too much. And I feel like uh, Tony's really good at distance. You know, I feel like uh, that right hand that he lands, you know, moving backwards, I feel like, uh, you know, that could cause Jake Matthews, who's at the in the past has been a little hesitant to get hit at times, and, you know, make him do something stupid, you know, like uh, shoot an unnecessary shot, which he's done in the past. And we know Tony Martin's got some really good jujitsu. So, you know, this fight's real tough to call for me because I could also see Tony, uh, you know, getting caught in this fight. You know, I'm, I'm scared of Jake's power at 170, so it's really – Torn, but I'm, I'm slightly leaning Tony Martin actually as an underdog. You know, I feel like his game's a little bit too savvy for Jake. I feel like Jake's gonna, you know, be forced to make a lot of mistakes. You know, mistakes that he used to make in the past. Uh, so I'm gonna go with Tony Martin, but it's a super tough fight that I'm just gonna sit back and enjoy. Yeah, like we mentioned, I mean, both of these guys are in prime form right now. This is the best version of Jake Matthews and Tony Martin that we've ever seen inside the octagon and uh, it only took uh, a little bit over 10 ufc fights for both of them to get to this point right Shaq? but uh it's awesome to see them finally living up to their potentials now the question is who's been looking better at 170 pounds because they've both been looking phenomenal i mean obviously when jake went out there destroyed li jing liang showed the kind of heart that was kind of missing in uh, some of his earlier ufc appearances uh, you kind of question where he was at you know, in, in some of those fights, that Andrew Holbrook fight, even even the win over Boyan Velichkovic, it was very ugly, man. And one thing with Jake Matthews, even when he was fed softballs, he had some very sketchy performances against them, man. I mean, I know you remember that Akbar Areola fight where he was a minus 1,000 favorite, and then he ate that massive head kick in the first round, gave everyone a heart attack. So it was always like, man, he's such a athletic guy, but he's kind of a shaky prospect in there. Well, I got to say that those days are long gone because you saw that fight with Shinsho Anzai. And before someone sits here and says, oh, shit, show Anzai and this and that. Well, first of all, let me know who's uh, just gone out there and dominated that guy bell to bell and just destroyed him the way that Jake Matthews did. I mean, even uh, his first round loss to Alberto Mina, that was a back and forth war while it lasted. When Jake Matthews went out there, uh, he just disposed of him in a way where it was like, okay, Jake Matthews is finally turning into his own. He's kind of finally coming into his own. He's finally evolving into the mixed martial artist that people were saying he was going to be when he uh, when he made his debut, man. Uh, you remember how, how hyped up he was? Now he's finally living up to the hype. And I feel like mental issues might be somewhat behind him because that fight with Li Jing Liang, man, he showed so much heart when uh, – you hit this guy with your biggest shots and he drops and you try to finish him. Then he gets back up. Then he's swinging at you. You try to guillotine him and you put him in a choke that would have tapped many other people. Then he's eye gouging you. There were many opportunities for Jake Matthews to look for the door and he didn't. He went out there, he 30-26, Li Jing Leon. Then obviously the first round stoppage of Shinsho Anza 
unbelievable job by him. It, he's finally putting his athleticism uh, to great use, and uh, he's doing things that some of the some of the greats do. You know, I'm not gonna sit here and compare him to GSP because that, you know, I'm not gonna get ahead of myself. But that fucking performance against Shinsho, like I said, dude, just blew him right out the water. And with uh, Tony Martin. Man, since he moved up to 70, he put that clinic on Keitaro, which no one had ever done at the time. And then against Ryan LaFleur, knocked him dead after dominating him. Unbelievable job by him. I feel like this might be that spot where Tony might resort back to his old ways where, you know, sometimes when things weren't going his way in the past, he would also check out. And I know he's looking better at 70, but I feel like the athleticism, the power, the strength of Jake Matthews is a little bit too much for Anthony Rocco Martin in this spot. I feel like Jake's going to overwhelm him here, man. I'm going to go with Jake. This kind of reminds me of uh, Jake versus Johnny Case for some reason, except it's at 170 pounds, and both guys are uh, a lot better versions of themselves. I'm going to go with Jake Matthews via second or third round finish here. Now, next up in the UFC light heavyweight division, we got Tyson Pedro. He's minus 460. The comeback on Mauricio Shogun Hua, or as we like to say in Brazil, Shaq, Mauricio Shogun is plus 365. Gotta know, man. You think my boy Mauricio Shogun can turn back the clock one last time? Yeah, uh, it's an interesting fight because, you know, I'm not really sold on Tyson Pedro. You know, I feel like his last fight was a, you know, uh, amateur mistake. You know, I feel like he uh, dropped over in St. Peru, and, you know, I feel like uh, a more calmer, collected guy would have, you know, stayed uh, stayed patient and finished the job and put and finished him with strikes, but he uh, went right for the takedown and, you know, gassed himself out and then ended up uh, getting submitted. And, you know, I've always had a spe- speculation that he's a little scared to get hit, but, you know, uh, that last fight was kind of embarrassing, in my opinion, on his part. You know, I feel like he, he should have got the job done there, and you know, uh, Shogun, I mean, he's coming off a devastating KO loss to Anthony Smith, but, you know, there's no shame in that. You know, with Shogun, it's really about his health. It's about his, 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 it's just about his health. You know, how much can the guy take? I mean, we're talking about, you know, probably 15, 20 years of taking damage. But, you know, if he was ever going to pull off a sneaky upset, I think it'd be this one because, you know, uh, I feel like Tyson Pedro, although he's way bigger than Shogun, probably stronger than Shogun, definitely fresher in the taking damage department. I feel like this guy is a little scared to get it on the chin, man. So, you know, uh, it's going to be interesting. Although I got to pick Pedro just based on the health factor, I wouldn't be shocked if Shogun came out here and uh, knocked him out unconscious and turned back the clock a little bit. But I got to pick Tyson Pedro just because, you know, the way Shogun's been looking, you know, I'm seeing him on these videos. I mean, man, he looks real old. He's, he's looking like uh He's looking like the, the the end is very, very near. So I, I got to go with Pedro by default, but uh, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see indeed. And, man, I've always kind of felt like Tyson Pedro was a fraud. I've never been impressed with this guy whatsoever. Like, I know uh, he went out there and finished Khalil Roundtree and beat Paul Craig, Saperbeck Safarov, great first-round finishes for him. But now he's fighting uh, Mauricio Shogun. I know he got brutally knocked out against Anthony Smith, but I think Anthony Smith would also brutally knock out Tyson Pedro. And prior to that, I mean, Mauricio Shogun was going out there upsetting top 10 guys such as Corey Anderson. He was actually on the longest streak of his UFC career up until that Anthony Smith fight. He was on a three-fight win streak. That's longer than uh, any win streak my boy Tyson Pedro's had in the octagon. I'll tell you that right now. The thing with Pedro is he's definitely the more physical, the more imposing guy. He's six foot five. He can pull off some, sne- uh, some I guess, freak submissions. Uh, it's not even like the technique's that great. It's just that he overpowers these guys, you know, being as big as he is. And he's a very young guy. Like you said, if there's ever a time when Mauricio Shogun's going to turn back the clock, it's got to be a fight like this because I don't think that Tyson Pedro is anything special at all. And I understand why he's favored. I just don't think he should be a minus 460 in this spot. So I'm actually going to go with Mauricio Shogun to come out here and uh, knock Tyson Pedro the fuck out, man, uh, with a with a leaping left hook or an overhand right. I'm going to go with Mauricio Shogun Hua via knockout. Co-main event of the evening. We got Justin Willis. He's minus 120. The comeback on Mark Hunt is plus 100. Shaq, this is Mark Hunt's retirement fight. It's been an unbelievable road. So what I got to know is, does he finish his career one fight above 500, or does he finish his career one fight below 500? 
Yeah, man, his last fight was also kind of, uh, I mean, Mark Hunt, he's been doing things like that for a while, though, so it really, it wasn't that embarrassing on his part, but, you know, his fight with um, Olenek, where he was, you know, it looked like he had uh, Olenek on the ropes there in the, in the early stages of that fight, and, you know, one takedown, back take, and uh, it was tap-tap, and, uh you know, Justin Willis could also give him a little criticizement in his last fight, you know, against Chase Sherman after, uh, you know, almost knocking him out, which, you know, he kind of has an excuse. He is young in his career. You know, after almost knocking him out, he kind of gassed out in that third round, and he let Sherman win around on all three cards in a UFC fight. So, you know, uh, it is what it is. You know, I feel like uh, Justin Willis is definitely, you know, the better athlete, the more hungrier guy, the more motivated guy by far, you know, this is Mark Hunt's last UFC fight. I mean, he's, you know, he's been on his way out for a while now, man. And, uh, you know, although I think Mark Hunt's got a lot more, you know, experience, Mark Hunt's one of these guys where, you know, like I said, the motivation factor, you know, I think he always, you know, has respect for himself, his fans. Of course, he wants to put on a show, but, you know, when, uh, the going gets tough and you got all those things in the back of your head. Do you really, uh, I'm not going to say that he doesn't care, but Justin Willis doesn't have those things going on in his head, you know? So I feel like everything is kind of leaning towards his Willis's favor. You know, I feel like at range, uh, I know Hunt knocked out some of the best of the best, but you know, Willis brings a, a different, you know, look, he's a southpaw. He likes to stay at range. He likes to stick in that jab one, two, right down the middle. And that's what he's going to skip. And he's super fast. He's super athletic. And I feel like uh, that could present him some problems. But at the same time, you know, some of the mistakes Willis was making in that third round against Sherman, he does that here. He's also going to get knocked out for the uh, first time as well. So it's going to be a a tough fight. But I I got Justin Willis. I just think he's more motivated. I feel like the motivation is going to carry him through this fight. You know, I feel like Mark Hunt had a good run. But I feel like uh, he's got one foot out the door. So. I like Justin Willis. You know, shout out to Mark Hunt on an unbelievable career. One of the most entertaining guys. And, you know, we talk about how Artem Lobov or this or that might be the best 500 fighter of all time. Michael Johnson, whatever. Mark Hunt might be the best uh, 500 fighter of all time because uh, it doesn't matter if he wins or loses. It's always an exciting fight with that guy. And not to mention, uh, he's by far the highest paid fighter on this entire card check. Uh, Mark Hunt ain't cheap, you know. You gotta pay at least seven. You gotta shell out seven fifty k to get Mark Hunt to fight on your card, man. So you, you know he's gonna walk home with his uh, with his pockets full, man. And and the taxes ain't gonna be too bad because he lives uh, over there, you know, down under. So M- much respect to Mark Hunt, man. I hope that he's getting a nice little retirement bonus as well. But the fact is here, man, that he doesn't have a good history against wrestlers and. St- Historically speaking, every time he fights a wrestler, he loses. I mean, the one time he beat a wrestler was uh, that guy, Chris Tuxer, who, you know, I mean, have we ever heard of that guy ever again? That guy went 1-3 and three in the UFC, and his only win was a majority decision over Tim Haig. You, you know, I don't got to say anything else about that, Shaq, okay? That's the only wrestler that Mark Hunt has ever beat. All the other ones, they uh, followed the exact blueprint to beat Mark Hunt, which is take him down over and over, one takedown per round, keep him down, beat him up. He's not getting back up. I mean, look what Stipe did. Look what Brock Lesnar did. Look what Curtis Blades did. So I feel like a guy like Justin Willis, who does train at AKA, who is one of Daniel Cormier's main training partners, I mean, dude, they got to have the game plan set here. I'm sure he's going to try to stand a little bit, but once he feels that power of Mark Hunt, if he is still conscious... He's going to duck under and take this guy down. And I know that the Chase Sherman fight got ugly at times, but I feel like when you're fighting a guy like Chase Sherman, you might want to try different elements of your game because you feel like there's not as much danger there. You feel like, oh, maybe I can stand up with this guy and then mix in my takedowns and you know try to kickbox with him, try to knock him out, try to do all these things. Whereas against Mark Hunt, it's like, let's not even give this guy any chance to win. Let's just go ahead and take him down, take him out of his game and get the biggest win of of our career because that Mark Hunt name on your resume, whether it was boring or not, is the biggest win of a career. We'll change your, uh, we'll change the the trajectory of where you're going to go, who you're going to fight next, what kind of opportunities you're going to get. And if Justin Willis wants to take that step up the rankings, if he wants to take his name into the limelight, if he wants to be talked at, talked about as a top 10 UFC heavyweight, then, uh, 
He's got to come out here and have a disciplined approach, and that means taking down Mark Hunt for three straight rounds. And I think that's exactly what he's going to do here, man. If he if he's not that smart and he wants to stand and bang with Hunt, not saying he can't win on the feet. He's a very athletic and talented guy. He's he's at, he's in the position he's in for a reason. But that will give Mark Hunt a chance to you know get get the farewell uh, walk off knockout. But I don't think it's going to happen, man. I think I think Willis is going to come out here smart, wrestle this guy, get the decision win, or pound him out. Main event of the evening, we got Junior Dos Santos. He's minus 150, and the comeback on tie to Ivasa is plus 130. Shaq, I got to know, man. You think Junior Dos Santos can uh, stay disciplined for five straight rounds and uh, and piece up the poor man's Mark Hunt? Yeah, man. Uh, to Ivasa, you know, for such a young guy, he's uh, at least in his one press where he had to go three rounds and stay composed. I know. You know, someone would counter me with, uh, oh, it was Andre Arlovsky, and, you know, this and that. I mean, Arlovsky at the time had a had a way of uh, making these young guys kind of, you know, do some questionable things. And Tui Vasa, I mean, he stayed composed, and he did his job like a like a seasoned vet, man. So props to him. Now, we know JDS is on a completely different level. Former champ, been in there with Stipe. I mean, everybody, Kane, uh for doom i mean the list goes on and on over him but uh this is definitely a step up for two of us you know uh i feel like jds has a way of uh although he's got all these vicious ko's on his record it's like at times he can show you uh that he's like also a very good point boxer man you know he can show you that he could jab to your body for five rounds to your head and just keep doing that in the occasional right hand and uh, just keep and keep doing his job, man. It's uh, he's actually got you know different facets to his game, different approach approaches to his game. He can also knock you out with that one shot. So, JDS, don't sleep on my boy JDS, man. You know, I remember the uh, the days where I used to say uh, you know uh, that his chin was completely shot, but I mean uh, he's been proving me wrong, especially his last fight. So I think I uh, you know he's more experienced into Avasa. I'm gonna go ahead and even say he's better. And every aspect into a Vasa, it's just a matter of uh, getting caught on the chin, in my opinion. You know, I feel like Tui Vasa is going to have a great career. I actually feel like he uh, is a bet. I think he's, you know, better than uh, a lot of heavyweight prospects have been in the past at this stage in his career. I, g- I give him a lot of credit. I just think he is just slightly not ready for this level yet. You know, I feel like. Uh, you know, Arlovsky and those guys are, you know, good steps up, but I feel like JDS is a, an elite step up. You know, I feel like uh, he's going to land his shots. And, you know, JDS, the way he's been fighting lately, his fights really tend to go later these days. And I think this fight's going to go later, too. You know, I feel like uh, JDS is just going to land the better shots throughout the five rounds, land the cleaner shots, stick, uh, stay composed, and stick that jab in his gut, stick that jab in his face. And uh, win a decision. But, you know, I got a lot of respect for Tui Vas. I think he'll be back. Yeah, and, you know, I'm just playing around when I say that he's a poor man's Mark Hunt. What I mean by that is that he emulates his style after Mark Hunt. He's Mark Hunt's protege. You know, he likes to leap in there with that left hook. He's kind of shorter for the division. He's a knockout artist. Uh, I like his elbow attacks, too, the leg kicks. He's got a great striking arsenal. I like how he pushes off in the clinch and lands big shots. Uh, He's got a bright future ahead of him, man. And with uh, Junior Cigano, he has found a way to, you know, not expose himself as much uh, when he fights these younger prospects. Not even younger prospects. Even a guy like Ben Rothwell, he was able to go out there and put on that five-round clinic against him, just like he did to Ivanov. And I feel like he can do the same thing here, too, against Tai Tuivasa. While I have been impressed with Tai Tuivasa, I still feel like he's got a lot of room to grow, man. You know, that Arlovsky fight, you know, we can make excuses, uh, oh, you know, Arlovsky uh, had a way of surviving against these younger kids. Yeah, this is very true. But I, I feel like that kind of showed uh, where Tuivasa was really at because when you're talking about a real super prospect who, you know, could be in line for a title shot, you're talking about a guy like uh, Francis Ngannou. And he, when he went out there and he was the prospect fighting Arlovsky, uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They had to retrieve Arlovsky's head in the third row. You know what I'm saying, Shaq? Whereas Tai Tuivasa... You know, he dropped him but couldn't finish the job. Then he let Arlovsky back in the fight. And no, no shame in that. Arlovsky's a seasoned tough guy, man, you know. But it just showed me that Tai Tuivasa still has a lot of work to do, that he's not quite on that level yet. And uh, 
I think that uh, Junior Dos Santos, he can land that nice jab to the, to the stomach like he likes to do, then start setting up the overhand, time the uppercut, the left hook, even uh, get off on some kicks as well. And I think that Tai Tuivasa can land some bombs too. Uh, I think that if he lands properly on the chin of Dos Santos, I mean, look, either guy lands properly. Someone's taking a canvas nap. These are four-ounce gloves and two heavyweights that throw uh, missiles. So don't be surprised if one guy slept. But I think that overall... Junior Dos Santos puts a MMA boxing clinic on him and, and wins this fight, man. And Tuivasa will be back. It's simply a first UFC L time. So I got a lot of respect for him. I got JDS for the victory. Now, uh, normally we hit up Kyle Marley for the Big Marley Minute. But, uh, you know, my boy Kyle Marley is being flown out by DraftKings right now as we speak. You know the deal uh, with the man himself uh, going out there, going to win these tournaments, going to do his thing going to remind everyone why he is the DraftKings guy for half the battle so make sure you hit up Kyle Marley at Big Marley 3 and uh, check out his write-ups you know I read them I read them every single week and uh, it's great material check him out at Big Marley 3 well Shaq now we got to talk about the fight to watch and the fighter to watch so what is the fight to watch for UFC Adelaide yeah my fight to watch is uh, Tony Martin versus Jake Matthews you got two you know hungry welterweights that uh Former lightweights moving up in weight. Both feel really confident. Both feel unstoppable. They feel like they're in their heads right now. Both men feel like they're about to take over 170. So somebody's dreams are going to get crushed on Saturday night. And I'm interested to see who it's going to be, man. You know, because uh, whoever wins this fight, I mean, they're, they're most likely getting a big fight next, man. Uh, and whoever loses this fight pretty much has to start back over and reassess things. So that's my fight to watch. Yeah, no doubt about it. That's absolutely one of the fights to watch. It's going to be really crazy seeing one of these guys take a setback in uh, the best possible form that we've ever seen them in. So I'm going to be tuning into that fight as well. But for me, man, the fight to watch has to be Jim the Brute Crew versus Paul the Bear Jew Craig. I mean, after Paul Craig's you know upset of the year in 2018 against Magomed and Kalaev. I mean, how can you not watch this guy every single time to see if, uh, is he going to take that ass whooping and then come back once again? But but like I mentioned, he's taking on a serious brown belt in Jim Crew who can also knock people out standing. He's an exciting Australian prospect. So there's so many reasons why I'm intrigued by this fight, Shaq. So for that reason, Jim Crew versus Paul Craig is my fight to watch. But Shaq, who is your fighter to watch for UFC Adelaide? Yeah, my fighter to watch is going to be Sadiq Yusuf. I'm really high on this kid. I think he's going to come out here and have a great performance on Saturday. And I also think he's going to be a player in the featherweight division down the line. So, Sadiq Yusuf. I'm actually going to agree with you on this one. Sadiq Yusuf is my fighter to watch as well. You know, this is a kid that I've been hearing about since he was in the amateur scene. You know, he would knock dudes out and then do the Harlem Shake. He already took his first L on the regional scene. Uh, it was it was insane, too. It was... Uh, Man, I don't even know what the fuck that move was called. It was almost like a like a drop slash fireman's carry on his face. And uh, he came back since then. He rebounded like a three-time world champion, knocked out Conor McGregor's teammate in under a minute, had that incredible war with Mike Davis on uh, Dana White Tuesday Night Contender. I feel like Sodiq Youssef is a top 25 guy right now. I feel like you could go in there, match Sodiq Youssef up with Ricardo Lamas and uh, – don't be surprised if uh, Lamas takes a canvas snap. That's how highly I regard Sodiq Yusuf. So, man, he is my fighter to watch for sure. Well, Shaq, we did it. It's going down this Saturday. UFC Adelaide, Junior Cigano versus Tai Tuivasa. The fans can follow you at MMA Genius 05. They can follow me at Best Fight Picks. They can subscribe to Half the Battle on iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, and Stitcher. And uh, thank you guys so much for the support. We'll be back next week. And until the next time, let's cash these bets.